We went to jail because it was impossible to sit still while the obscenity of the apartheid system was being imposed on our people. The United States is seen, quite correctly, as being the sole supporter of Israel, and that Israel would not be able to do what it is doing without American green light. The U.S.-Israeli relationship is really unique on Capitol Hill. In my 22 years that I served there, there was never a moment when there was really a debate about U.S. policy in the Middle East. It was always, what does Israel want? And almost always, Congress gave them exactly what they wanted without any debate, without any amendments being considered. This type of policy exists for, as a result of a number of factors. First of all, there is the lobby, the U.S. lobby for Israel. APAC, American-Israeli uh, Public Affairs Committee. It has a multi-million dollar budget. It has a highly professional group of people working on Capitol Hill. They know the legislative process, they know the personalities, and uh, therefore advance what's best for the state of Israel. Congress seems to think that if you oppose what Israel wants, you'll be defeated in the next election. Another factor is the fundamentalist Christian community. Fundamentalists are often represented by the televangelists that are on TV. They believe that uh, a strong Israel is a part of God's plan. They believe that uh, the day will come when a battle will occur in the plain of Armageddon in the Middle East. There will be the forces of truth and righteousness on one side, force of evil on the other side. And in that struggle, the Christian forces led by the second coming of Jesus Christ will prevail. All of the Jews will be either destroyed or converted instantly to Christianity. It may sound to the, to the viewer as a very uh, far out notion, but believe me, it is widely held and supported by millions of Americans whose doctrines really in the ultimate are hostile to the survival of Jews, but nevertheless the supporters of Israel see this vast body of American people as being a great asset at this time, so they embrace them. And Mr. Robertson who said, I had a vision from God that we have to support Israel. And no matter what happens and what they do, this is the will of God because they're God's chosen people. A couple of weeks later, he added, and that's when this ministry started really being blessed, when we made that commitment to Israel. Not the commitment to God or Jesus Christ's teachings, but to Israel. And we have come from all the nations of the earth to say to the people of Israel, we are your friends, we are with you, and we believe that you are called by God to possess this land. I, as a Christian and a Christian pastor, object not in my name and not in the name of over 115 to 120 million Christians do you dare say that we support injustice and deceit. We do not. The citizenry of this democratic society is systematically deprived of access to the real facts. The American media play a major role in continuing U.S. support for Israel through leaving out vast swaths of information. It is the classic case of lying through omission. Major statements by American diplomats, senators, military leaders are going unreported. Sentences are being removed from news stories. Information is being manipulated. Those are the three factors that work together on Capitol Hill and lead to such total bias, such total absence of free speech, of open debate that is, I think, very destructive to our institutions and to our best interests in world affairs. So Israel, for example, does not abide at all by international law. The entire occupation is illegal. It's a violation in particular of the Fourth Geneva Convention. 
By the rules of the Fort Geneva Convention, you're not allowed to build settlements, you're not allowed to build roads, you're not allowed to expropriate land, you're not allowed to deport people, you're not allowed to, to restrict their freedom of movement, you're not allowed to uh, harm their economy, you're not allowed to make them unemployed and impoverished. But everything that Israel does in the occupied territories, U.S. taxpayers are paying for. The U.S. gives the financing, it gives the military support. Israel uh, receives as much foreign economic assistance as all the countries combined in the world. Combined in the world. In March 2003, the U.S. government approved $10 billion in aid for Israel. At the same time, it withheld a $3.5 billion grant to upgrade the training of first responders, those who would be first to respond to a terrorist attack. Spent domestically, that $10 billion could buy health care coverage for over 4 million children without proper coverage or pay for one and a half million American children to attend Head Start child development programs to prepare them for school, or simply help states offset the costs of one of the worst fiscal crises in half a century. represents the views of the Pentagon that sees Israel now as an indispensable strategic ally in the effort to control and exert influence throughout the region. The main concern for the United States, like the world, is the, the oil-producing regions. And in order to control that, you need a way of doing it. Desperate for a peace that would finally end occupation, Palestinians again came to the negotiating table in 2000. People think, look, Israel was very forthcoming. It offered 95% of the West Bank, of the occupied territories to the Palestinians, and they rejected it in violence. The assumption of that 95% argument is that getting 95% of the land gives you 95% sovereignty, a sovereign country. But I think it's very useful to think in terms of a prison. If you look at a blueprint of a prison, it looks like the prisoners own the place. 
And the prisoners have 95% of the area. They've got the, the living areas, they have the exercise yard, they have the uh, cafeteria, they've got the work areas. All the prison authorities have is 5%, is the control. The average Palestinian didn't think they were throwing anything away because there was nothing to throw away. They had tuned out what Barack and Arafat were talking about because on the ground there were ongoing land expropriations, tree uprootings, road building, unfair water allocation, leaving many Palestinian families in the summer and fall with two hours of running water a week. But next door you have a settlement with a swimming pool and green lawns. So what do you expect people to think? <laughs> And it was that pressure, that sense of being squeezed, uh, that finally exploded in September of 2000 in what became the Second Intifada. Second Intifada is essentially a mobilization of resistance against this structure of occupation and oppression. Israel, from the very beginning of these demonstrations, had indeed relied on excessive force. They had used live ammunition against unarmed demonstrators, had inflicted several deaths. and hundreds of casualties in the opening days of the Intifada. Sometimes the Israelis are, are speaking about rubber bullets they used. By the way, it's not rubber, it's steel coated with rubber. This bullet, it killed many of, uh, of the kids uh, who are demonstrating, I mean, sometimes um, while they are throwing stones. As this case, I'll show you what happened. He is a 14 years old from Khan Yunus. He was shot with one like this and entered here, and he died. A lot of the, the deaths have been children, and we do have some documentary evidence that security forces are firing on crowds of children. The soldiers weren't at risk. They're heavily armored, they have all this high-powered weaponry, and no child with a stone is going to be a, a risk to them. And most of the Palestinian abuses involve um, shooting at settlements, um, ambushes on settler cars, and obviously the suicide bombings inside Israel. There are some risks to Israeli life. Many Israelis have been killed. When there was this horrible suicide bombing at, at the pizza place in Jerusalem, I went to visit some of the kids who survived that blast in the hospital. It was horrible. It was horrible to see what happened to these children. You see the blood, you see the agony of the family. This is what the world sees. But one cannot take it out of the general context. And the context is of an Israeli occupation, which is, it seems not to be so brutal, but it's very brutal. It really makes people's lives unbearable. The use of suicide bombers is an act of desperation. It's the weapons of the weak.